May Jesus and Mary be loved by all hearts. There are two end-time events that have long been prophesied and which we should anticipate with joy, not fear. The first goes by several names, the warning, also the illumination of consciences, or the second Pentecost. The other one goes by just one name, the three days of darkness. These two events are totally separate, but because they have some similarities, certain commentators on the internet are confusing them as one event or conflating them as if they will occur in quick succession. I blame some of the internet sites who use fear as clickbait, and Catholics are guilty of going there to feed feelings of excitement because the emotion of fear does provide an emotional kick. You can call it fear porn. The three days of darkness is not around the corner, right after the warning and the three years of the Antichrist. The three days of darkness is the climax and finale of a long series of chastisements. We've got a long road ahead of us, and we're not going to be raptured out, and we're not going to sit out the years in caves and refuges while angels feed us popcorn to watch the show. Remember Lot's wife. God will punish you if your life is as sterile as salt. Prophecies are not given to entertain us or to satisfy our curiosity. People who get a high on the punishment coming to others will bring God's wrath on themselves. God takes no pleasure in punishing. God wants you to get out and work to convert as many souls as possible. People who love fear porn websites will have to give a serious accounting for every idle word that they read and repeat. People who follow false commentators will be held just as guilty as the ones who caused the scandal. Christians are called to be witnesses. The Greek word is martyr. If we get physically killed in doing our job as Christians, so be it. Relax. Are you afraid to die and go to heaven? Or are you clinging to false hopes about refuges? There are similarities between the warning and the three days of darkness, and some people get confused. Both events will be an act of God, not man. Both events will be experienced by every individual on the planet as a divine judgment. This can be pleasant if you have tried to serve God. Listen to St. Paul, 1 Corinthians 4, 5. God will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of hearts. Then every man will receive his praise from God. Both events will have the effect of expelling demons. After each event, there will be many conversions, and Christianity will spread throughout the world. Each is a unique event in the history of the world, an enormous grace which surely our generation does not deserve. It seems to me that the first grace, the warning, is being merited by the thousands of recent martyrs and the aborted children who have chosen to forgive their parents. The last grace, the defeat of all the enemies of God, will be the intervention of the sorrowful and immaculate heart of Mary and the prayers and sufferings of the many souls consecrated to her. An anonymous pamphlet on the three days of darkness began circulating in 1966. It was immensely popular, and it's influenced millions of Catholics ever since. To be more precise, it has terrified millions of Catholics. I cleaned up a photocopy of the original pamphlet, and I am posting it on the House of Mary website. The first page admits that it is a compilation after a study of various quotations of our Divine Lord, quoting Blessed Mother, and a number of holy people such as Blessed Anne Marie Tegi in Rome, Saint Padre Pio, Père Lamy, a priest in France, Elizabeth Canori Mora in Rome, Sister Rose Columba Ascendente of Italy, Father Nectu, a Jesuit priest in Belgium, Sister Palma Doria in Italy, Sister Marie Beowardi, a Carmelite in France, Marie Julie Jehenny, also in France, Saint Hildegard of Germany, and Marie Martel of Normandy, and others. The pamphlet is lacking in footnotes and quotation marks, leaving no hint about which saint or prophet said what or in what context. I'm not saying that this pamphlet and some popular websites fail to offer some factual citations from credible prophecies, but the way the information is combined can lead to grave misinterpretations. In fact, when you look up some of these saints and prophets separately and go down some rabbit holes, you discover that some quotations are actually a string of utterances which can be taken out of context. You would learn, for example, that Sister Marie Beroardi of France never said that three-fourths of the population would perish during the three days of darkness. 
Today she is known as Saint Miriam, the little Arab, because she was born in the Holy Land and died in the Holy Land. Let's parse out what she actually said, at least in our English translation. All states will be shaken by war and civil conflict, period. During a darkness lasting three days, the people given to evil ways will perish so that one-fourth of mankind will survive. All states will be shaken by war and civil conflict. We've been seeing that for quite some time. It's not her unique prophecy. Jesus and the book of Revelation predicted a time of chastisements involving a series of wars, plagues, and famines. What percentage of mankind is already perishing now or will perish in the wars and civil conflicts to come? Statistics tell us that almost 10 million people a year are dying of famine. When is the starting date and how long a time does that go on before the three days of darkness? Did the saints say precisely that three fourths would perish during the three days? Not if you look at the text. It says that people given to evil will perish and evidently at the end of all these events, wars, conflicts, famines, and whatever happened in the three days of darkness, when one fourth of mankind will survive compared to the population years before when the conflict started. Histories try to estimate the percentage of the population that perished in the Middle Ages from the Black Plague. But when you read the details, it was not one quick epidemic, but waves that would hit a city here, then a city there, then a couple of decades would pass, then the plague would hit the same area or some other area. Even at the time of Moses, the disasters that struck Egypt did not happen in the space of a three-hour movie, but involved different crops at different times of the year. The plagues of Egypt occurred over a span of many months and perhaps several years. Obviously, the population will be diminished before the three days begin because we can assume that the usual wars and plagues and famines that afflict the earth will be occurring at an accelerated pace. These are indeed punishments that God's providence allows bringing death and desolation, but they don't terrify us as much, perhaps, because they are familiar. Moreover, they are partially man-made events, which we like to think we can control. Blessed Anne-Marie Teji is the primary prophetess of the three days of darkness, so let's focus on some of her bullet points. Quote, God will send two punishments. One will be in the form of wars, revolutions, and other evils, and it shall originate on earth. Got it. That's clear. Next, the other punishment will be sent from heaven. Heaven, not hell. People get their fears all upside down. The punishments originating from earth are cruel because they are stirred up by demons who influence sinful men and women. Man's inhumanity to man involves decades of barbed wire, concentration camps, torture techniques, surveillance, unjust prison sentences, and the list goes on. The three days of darkness is a punishment originating from heaven. The source of this punishment is infinite divine mercy. So it will be quick, because the most merciful thing to do is to get it over with. King David knew that when he had the chance to choose the punishment for Israel to atone for the sin of the census. Quote, the prophet Gad came to David and told him, Shall three years of famine come to you in your land? Or will you flee three months before your foes while they pursue you? Or shall there be three days pestilence in your land? David replied, Let us fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercy is great, but let me not fall into the hand of man. Thus he chose the pestilence. Next point from Blessed Anne Marie. There shall come over the whole earth an intense darkness lasting three days and three nights. What kind of darkness? Let's look at Exodus 10.22. Quote, Moses stretched out his hand toward heaven, and there was thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. They could not see one another, nor did any rise from his place for three days. But, and note this, all the people of Israel had light where they dwelt. End quote. So the darkness was unnaturally dark. Even at night, we can usually see something, and evidently lamps were of no help to the Egyptians. Were the Israelites walking around as if in sunshine, or did their oil lamps shed light inside their houses? Next point, Blessed Anne Marie again. It will be impossible to use any man-made lighting during this darkness, except blessed candles. He who out of curiosity opens his window to look out, or leaves his home, will fall dead on the spot. Kind of reminds you of um, Lot's wife. 
During these three days, people should remain in their homes, pray the rosary, and beg for mercy. Moses announced the plagues in advance. The Israelites understood that the Egyptians were being punished. Likewise, God has given us prophets so that we will know what to do. Even if we are caught in a place without a blessed candle, we can just pray in peace because we know what's happening and that it will be over in three days. But notice the mercy. If someone in a house steps out, they will die instantly. They will not suffer the horror of the three days which the wicked are going through. Why would a Christian leave the house? Some say that demons will imitate the voices of children or relatives who call out for help to allure people outdoors. Continuing Blessed Anne Marie, the air shall be infested by demons who will appear under all sorts of hideous forms. End quote. The Egyptians felt terror because they could hear natural sounds such as wild beasts without being able to see to defend themselves, as related in the Book of Wisdom. But Blessed Anne Marie says this terror will come from the presence of demons who can be seen in the darkness. So the three days involves two kinds of punishment. Keep in mind that this scourge comes from heaven. It's an act of mercy. In Egypt, the Israelites had three days of terror to think about the power of Yahweh. At the end, the light returned and Pharaoh immediately called Moses and told him to leave the country. But Pharaoh couldn't agree on the terms because he was attached to material wealth. Go serve Yahweh. Your children also may go with you, but your flocks and your herds must remain behind. Nine plagues of mercy served to prove how hard the hearts were in Egypt, represented in the person of their king. Scripture relates that only a remnant of Egyptians asked to join Israel in their trek to the wilderness to worship Yahweh. So after the three days of darkness, God could do nothing with their impenitence. So he sent the plague that killed the firstborn, and then he closed the Red Sea over the warriors. Blessed Anne Marie tells us, quote, On this terrible occasion, so many of these wicked men, enemies of the church and of their God, shall be killed by this divine scourge, that their corpses around Rome will be as numerous as the fish, which a recent flooding of the Tiber had carried into the city. All the enemies of the church, secret as well as known, will perish over the whole earth during that universal darkness, with the exception of some few whom God will soon after convert. God doesn't need three days to kill people. In his infinite mercy, in this final plague, he's letting the wicked have a taste of the company that they're going to have in hell. Even in this horrible time, some will call on God and be spared. My heart leaps with joy when I consider the divine mercy, far more tender than the best parent for a wayward son or daughter. Just as the plague of the firstborn and the warriors only affected the enemies of Israel, so this final plague is directed particularly at the wicked. So why are Christians obsessed with it and terrorized by it? Let's go back to Blessed Anne Marie. Why does she bring up Rome? The corpses around Rome will be as numerous as the fish brought up by a recent flood. In her whole prophecy, she doesn't mention any other city, just the seat of the governing body of the church, where important prelates reside who are responsible for appointing good and holy bishops throughout the world. Quote, on this terrible occasion, she goes on, all the enemies of the church, secret as well as known, will perish. Blessed Anne Marie happened to live in Rome, so you could say that Rome was her world, but it doesn't take rocket science for us today to understand that God is assuring us that he will take special care to eliminate the corrupt leaders in the church. Blessed Anne Marie continues, After the three days of darkness, Saints Peter and Paul, having come down from heaven, will preach throughout the world and designate a new pope. A great light will flash from their bodies and settle upon the cardinal, the future pontiff. This paragraph could be interpreted in a less literal sense, but it is certainly meant to assure us that the intercession of the two greatest leaders of the early church will obtain for the renewed and purified church a good and holy pontiff. Actually, this might require some miraculous intervention because the see of Peter may have been vacant for quite a while, and the regular channels for a proper papal election might well be disrupted. Perhaps the majority of the prelates will either have died in the recent chastisements, or else, according to words ascribed to the Carmelite saint, Miriam the Little Arab, 
Most of the clergy will die in defense of the faith of their country. Blessed Anne Marie isn't the only prophet who offers insights. The different evangelists reached their particular audience in their day, and then later their gospels were eventually published with the other gospels. Each evangelist might add a few more details, but sometimes an effort is required from the reader to reconcile apparent discrepancies. Marie Julie Jehenny said, during these three days of terrifying darkness, no windows must be opened because no one will be able to see the earth and its terrible color without dying at once. No one outside a shelter will survive. Red clouds like blood will move across the sky. The crash of the thunder will shake the earth and sinister lightning will streak the heavens out of season. The earth will be shaken to its foundations. The sea will rise. Its roaring waves will spread over the continent. How does that square with what Blessed Anna Marie said? All the enemies of the church, secret as well as known, will perish, with the exception of some few whom God will soon after convert. We could assume that these few survived because they found their way into a shelter. But what about Padre Bernardo, who evidently heard it from Blessed Anna Maria, that great sinners will be converted because they will then know God? I think we can imagine that in the days of Noah, when the waters began to rise, some people remembered the warning they received when they heard why Noah was building an enormous ark. So now that they face death, some of them, perhaps many, repent of their sins and beg God for forgiveness. They drown, but their souls had converted, and thus they were saved. That's how we could square these credible prophets who describe the event a bit differently. What did Our Lady say about the three days of darkness? She has a great deal to say about the warning, which she usually calls the second Pentecost. And this is something she urges us to pray for because it will bring about the conversion of many hearts. And I did a whole video on that. You can look it up. Mary has a great deal to say about the events that follow the warning, namely the time of the Antichrist, because she wants us to be prepared and to understand the symbols in the book of Revelation. It seems that Mary has far less to say about the three days of darkness because this comes at the end of the struggle, as the finale, when her heart will triumph. God will definitively eliminate all the wicked and expel all demons from the earth. At La Salette, she said, I'm quoting paragraph 20, It will be believed that all is lost. Only homicides will be seen. Only the sound of weapons and blasphemies will be heard. The righteous will suffer much. Their prayers, their penance, and their tears will mount to heaven. And all the people of God will ask pardon and mercy and will ask for my help and intercession. Then Jesus Christ, by an act of his justice and his great mercy for the righteous, will command his angels to put all his enemies to death. Suddenly, all the persecutors of the church of Jesus Christ and all men given to sin will perish, and the earth will become like a desert, not a garden. Then there will be peace, reconciliation between God and men. Jesus Christ will be served, adored, and glorified. Charity will blossom everywhere. The new kings will be the right arm of the Holy Church, which will be strong, humble, pious, poor, zealous, imitating the virtues of Jesus Christ. The gospel will be preached everywhere, and mankind will make great progress in the faith, because there will be unity among the workers of Jesus Christ, and men will live in the fear of God. And in her last paragraph at La Salette, Behold the time, the abyss opens up. Behold the king of kings of darkness. Behold the beast with its subjects, calling itself the savior of the world. He will rise with pride into the air in order to obtain heaven. He will be suffocated by the breath of St. Michael the Archangel. He will fall, and the earth, which for three days have been in continuous convulsions, will open its bosom full of fire. He will be plunged forever with his subjects into the eternal chasms of hell. Then water and fire will purify the earth and consume all the works of men's pride, and all will be renewed. God will be served and glorified. Don Raphael, a contemporary and confidant of Blessed Anna Maria, told her biographer that she had said that the three days would come to pass when every human hope for the persecuted church shall have vanished. I would suggest that Mary referred very often to the three days of darkness, every time she assured us that in the end my immaculate heart will triumph, and every time she asked for souls to be consecrated to her because she needs their merits to help her achieve a definitive defeat of Satan. 
Fear porn internet sites are trying to excite Catholics that the warning is imminent, and that's credible, but they say only six weeks after the warning, the three and a half year reign of the Antichrist will begin, and that period will conclude with the three days of darkness, and then suddenly the earth will be a paradise. So in their view, this immense grace of the illumination of consciences will be a seed of faith that will have to germinate and flower and bear fruit in many hearts who will be learning of God's love for the first time in their lives. And this joyful time will be cut short to six weeks because God is evidently in their view, cruel and impatient. And he doesn't really want to give them a chance to convert. Where do these people get these ideas from false prophets? Mary has told us that a second joyful grace is promised within a year after the warning, a miracle at Mary's shrine in Garabondo. Only after that, she says, will the Antichrist rise to power. But no, no, that's too slow for fear porn Catholics or their false prophets who are collecting money for refuges because they promise you'll be protected from suffering and fed by angels. I've been told personally that the main perpetrator of the quick timeline has a reputation for asking to be invited to audiences, quote, who are likely to write checks. Hmm, red flag. Fear porn internet sites prey on human laziness. These sites attract clicks from lazy Christians who don't want to hear that they're going to face a time of persecution and martyrdom. So they tell stories of cozy refuges and because you are special and won't have to suffer. At the end, these lazy Christians can just prance out of their hiding places into a new earth, a garden of Eden. They don't remember the very graphic descriptions in the Bible of what the earth will look like after the three days, the last great scourge of Yahweh. As Blessed Anna and others said, the earth will be covered with bodies. Listen to Isaiah chapter 66, starting verse 22. For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, remain before me, so shall your descendants and your name remain from new moon to new moon and from sabbath to sabbath all flesh shall come to worship before me says yahweh and they shall go forth and look on the dead bodies of the men that have rebelled against me ezekiel 39 12 for seven months the house of israel will be burying them in order to cleanse the land all the people of the land will bury them. They will set apart men to pass through the land continually and bury those remaining upon the face of the land so as to cleanse it. At the end of seven months, they will make their search. And when these pass through the land and anyone sees a man's bone, then he shall set up a sign by it till the barriers have buried it. Thus they shall cleanse the land. Pretty grim. And Revelation 19:17. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun with a loud voice he called to all the birds that fly in mid-heaven, Come, gather for the great supper of God to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. Padre Bernardo Clausi, a religious of the order of the Menims, who knew Blessed Anna Maria, said, this scourge will be felt throughout the world and will be so terrible that survivors will imagine they are the only persons spared. Maria Julie Jeheni, the earth will become like a vast cemetery. The bodies of the wicked and the just will cover the ground. That hardly sounds like a Garden of Eden. Beware of another trap that some commentators fall into. Blessed Anna Maria spoke of both events, the illumination of consciences and also the three days of darkness. It is easy for compilers of her sayings to conflate the events which have similar characteristics. Let's read, after the three days of darkness, Saints Peter and Paul come down from heaven to appoint the Pope, etc. Then Christianity will spread throughout the world. Period. Pause. The next line isn't in chronological order, but applies to the previous grace of the illumination of consciences. Quote, whole nations will join the church shortly before the reign of the Antichrist. These conversions will be amazing, end quote. We can be sure of this because the next sentence says, those who survive shall have to conduct themselves well. Now, if the whole earth is renewed, why would survivors have to conduct themselves well? Obviously, it's because Christians will be moving into a time of persecution and they might succumb to the temptations of the Antichrist and deny their faith if they are not careful to keep their souls in a state of grace. By the way, some will die during the warning from the sheer horror of seeing their sins. 
Others might be taken to heaven, not called to live through the chastisements and persecutions. Anna Maria goes on, and I really don't know which event she's referring to, quote, there shall be innumerable conversions of heretics who will return to the bosom of the church. All will note the edifying conduct of their lives, as well as that of other Catholics. Russia, England, and China will come into the church, end quote. We cited something similar above from La Salette. Maximin saw that a great country in the north would become Catholic and inspire conversions throughout the world. That might be Russia or England. I did a 14-part series on the apocalypse which shows in detail that the events in the book only appear to be related in sequence. In reality, the same events are described in seven parallel sequences. I built a table of seven sevens to show that the book is about the fulfillment of the great Feast of Tabernacles and the ultimate Feast of Jubilee, which takes place after seven sets of seven sabbatical years. The same disruption in chronology happens in The Secret of La Salette. The secret seems to come to a climax more than once. Then in the next paragraph, Our Lady seems to start over again, but she is only returning to the story to emphasize different aspects of the same set of events. In a long video on a timeline, I made the point that the three days of darkness is the finale of a series of purifications and chastisements that includes the second three and a half years of the Antichrist. Yes, there are two sets. According to Daniel, the first begins from the moment that the daily sacrifice is abolished and the horrible abomination is set up. There shall be 1,290 days. That's the first three and a half years. And then he says, blessed is he who waits with patience and attains 1,335 days. That's the second set of three and a half years. This is also referred to elsewhere as a time, two times, and a half a time. The opening salvo is the time of the Antichrist, who will reign in person about three and a half years, then be cut down. Then a long time, which the double time, which corresponds to what happened after the death of Jesus Christ. The people who killed him had time to reflect on the shocking idea that the Messiah could indeed be a carpenter, that he could be divine, that his first mission was to establish a kingdom in the hearts of men and die for their sins. Those new ideas took time to absorb, and God is merciful. Many people converted, and the apostles began to spread beyond Israel and to work signs and preach the gospel. But in that period of mercy, other hearts hardened and demanded an earthly Messiah who would drive out the Romans. Finally, it came to the half a time, which is the second set of three and a half years. This became very violent around 70 AD as the Jews drove the Romans out of Jerusalem. But the Romans stayed there and set up a siege for three and a half years, 67 to 70 AD, until finally the whole place was burned down and the soldiers physically dismantled the stones that were still standing. That was the grand finale of the old worship according to the old law, making room for the true Christ. God gave the world a great prophet in the person of John the Baptist who prepared the people calling them to repent by a ritual washing of their sins and thus be prepared to recognize the Christ. Most Pharisees and Sadducees scoffed at John's prophecies and they were the ones who ended up completely failing to recognize the true Messiah and in fact helped to put him to death. And before the end time events still before us, God has given the world a greater prophet, his own mother, not to one small nation, but to the whole earth. The mother of Jesus can't reach everybody because not all know who Jesus is. So her spouse, the Holy Spirit, will be entering every heart in a great illumination of conscience so that people can repent and be purified before the coming of the Antichrist. The ones who repent will recognize the false Christ as false, and they will not be led astray. The ones who cling to their sins will be deceived by the false Messiah and will help to persecute those who adhere to the true Christ. Don't be foolish. Do your own fact-checking. Read texts carefully. Grow up spiritually. You don't have to live in fear. You have been chosen, predestined to live in this biblical era. Trust God. He will give you all the graces you need. It's a privilege and honor to fight for His glory. If you're in a state of grace and have a loving relationship with the Holy Trinity, and are receiving the sacrament of forgiveness regularly, you have nothing to fear.
be not afraid.